You better move back a little. I mean, this kind of a, it's a very risky experiment. It might not be Hoorah, any, hoorah, ik ben op weg naar anything. Amerika. Hoorah, hoorah, driewerf, hoorah voor Amerika. De mensen met vrienden in Amerika. Die ene vriend waar dit bezoek toe dient. Een verre vriend die alle eer verdient. Verwante, schilderende, dichtende vriend. Lawrence El Magnifico de San Francisco. Hoera, hoera, wij zijn in Amerika. Hoera, hoera, driewerf, hoera voor Amerika. Well, I'm going to mix another paint now so you can turn it off for a second. As I grow older, I perceive life has its tail in its mouth. And other poets, other painters are no longer any kind of competition. It's the sky that's the challenge. It's the sky that still needs deciphering. Even as astronomers strain to hear it with their huge electric ears. The sky that whispers to us constantly the final secrets of the universe. The sky that breathes in and out as if it were the inside of a mouth of the cosmos. The sky that is the land's edge also and the sea's edge also. The sky with its many voices and no God. The sky that engulfs a sea of sound and echoes it back to us, as in a wave against a seawall. Whole poems, whole dictionary rolled up in a thunderclap. And every sunset, an action painting. And every cloud, a book of shadows, through which wildly fly the vowels of birds about to cry. And the sky is clear to the fisherman, even if overcast. He sees it for what it is, a mirror of the sea, about to fall on him in his wood boat. We have to think of him as the poet, forever face to face with old reality, where no birds fly before a storm. And he knows what's coming down before the dawn. And he's his own best lookout, listening for the sound of the universe and singing out his sightings of the land of the living. It used to be a very white city, San Francisco was. When I first arrived in 1951, it was uh, mostly small white buildings. And uh, there was no downtown uh, high-rise skyscraper, um, especially North Beach, which is the flat area around Telegraph Hill. That was uh, 
the old Italian district. It's a city which has changed less than all the other American cities. To me, it's still the most European city of uh, Yeah, because American it country. still has a center to it. It's not like one long freeway. Yeah. And the, the fact is that now, in, in most of the United States, the freeway is, is Main Street, USA. My first glimpse of you was with your arms up raised in the, in the spotlights at Royal Albert Hall. Was it 68? 60, uh, 65, actually. And uh, I said, well, who is this crazy uh, wild Finley. man visionary up there that's uh, shouting to the top of the stadium? Love, love, love. Yeah, because right. Harry Finley drove me crazy, and I thought he was driving everybody crazy, so I thought I'll... Uh, exercise uh, his things in the side, Everything shouting was love, love, crazy love. That night, yeah. Right. yeah, I was so straight in those days. I didn't even know at the time that many people were on acid. I didn't know that they were that uh, there was LSD. I didn't know what LSD was at that time, believe it or yeah. not. Uh -huh. I was up on stage with all of you guys, but I had no idea what was really going on. I was just yeah. uh, drinking. Was I was just drinking. I didn't have any, uh, didn't even smoke a joint or anything. I was completely straight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys are all out of your heads. In a way, yes, yes. <laughs> well, there was a feeling of like, uh, uh, poets were going to take over world government or something, save the earth uh, yeah. or whatever, uh, Greenpeace poet, uh, whatever. What happened to the movement? And you still think there is a movement around? Like most movements, it got flushed down the drain. <laughs> it, uh, a time passed and everyone grew up. We wanted to start it out as counterculture hippies or artists or musicians or writers. Became famous and, and became absorbed into the system. It's what Her Herbert Marcuse uh, uh, referred to when he said that the uh, uh, Marcuse spoke of the enormous capacity of the repressive society or the dominant culture to ingest its own most dissident elements. And many things will never be the same, which is what people keep saying about the French student revolution in 68. And yet if you walk around Paris these days, you wonder how 68 uh, ever happened in France. It's hard to believe that. Yeah, it because you see yuppies all over the world. I mean, yeah, and it's the same here. Yeah, uh, getting gentrified. Uh, I know in our favorite cafes here in North Beach, it used to be more or less broken down places. Now they're very gentrified cafes, such as the one we went to today. This way? Oh, are we coming this way? That's all the City Lights books. Those, these, and these. Yeah. And these are the biographies? Uh, that's... I was looking for an Edgar Allan Poe book, Eureka, but I didn't see it with the... Oh, uh, no, Eureka. And this is jazz? Yeah, that's jazz and his classical music. Yeah, it's all the translations. And this uh, poetry room here. The name City Lights refers to a famous movie by Charles Chaplin. He's one of your main culture heroes, isn't he? Well, he's, he's the little man against the big, cold, big, cruel world. He represents the free individual, uh, the free spirit against the world. And especially these days, uh, it's, uh, it's important to, uh, for uh, this little man to uh, stand up and be heard, and it's more or less the poet's position, and it's the position that City Lights Bookstore has always had as a publisher. Uh, we always uh, felt that the poet was defined uh, as the uh, the uh, eros being, E-R-O-S, that is, uh, the love-seeking, pleasure-seeking being inside of everyone. Uh, but as such, by definition, the poet is an enemy of the state. Ideal poem from our point of view, from, 
from the point of view of the poet as enemy of the state, is a poem that everyone can understand. It has a public surface that everyone can understand, but it has to have more than a public surface or else it remains just pure journalism. Then it has to have several other levels, a subjective level, uh, a subversive level, particularly subjective if it's going to be real poetry, really important poetry. It has to have more than one level. But if, if you don't have a public surface, then no one's, going, no one's attention is going to be held and no one's going to listen, everyone's going to fall asleep. <laughs> I got grouped with the beat poets because we we're more or less in the same time frame, but I became associated with the beat poets by publishing them. Yes. I was when they were when they first showed up in New York and Times Square or at Columbia University, Jack Kerouac and and Burroughs and Ginsburg and Corso. Uh, this was in the uh, late 1940s. I was in Paris studying for a doctorate at the Sorbonne, living in a French family. I didn't know any American poets. It's only after I came to San Francisco and we started City Lights Bookstore and poets naturally congregate around bookstores. So that's when I started meeting the all these New York carpetbaggers, these poets from New York or from Massachusetts or from the East Coast. I call them carpetbaggers, which is a term that comes from the yeah. American Civil War. Yeah. Uh, uh, salesmen from up north who came to the south. Well, when they all arrived in San Francisco, naturally they gravitated to bookstores, and ours was the bookstore where no one bothered you and you could hang out all day. And So then I started publishing them. Uh, but uh, my poetry remained completely different. Uh, San Francisco had two earthquakes, the beginning of the century, a real earthquake, mm -hmm. and then we had the summer of love with the hippies. You expect mm -hmm. another earthquake, and how would it look? Well, it's, uh, I don't expect any social earthquake in the near future. Uh, uh, the best earthquake that could happen now is for the earth to open up and swallow Ronald Reagan. I mean, Ronald Reagan has been an absolute disaster for the United States of America. And he's also an international crook. He has broken the law, both the American law and international law, much worse than uh, President Nixon ever broke it. I mean, President Nixon looks like a Boy Scout next to uh, President Reagan and his uh, cohorts. Communists aren't radicals anymore. Their Communist Party has played a reactionary role in, in the last 20 years. And in practically every uh, incipient revolution or insurrection, the Communist Party played a reactionary role. Uh, that was certainly the case in the French Student Revolution in 1968. You wrote a novel about it? Yes, I did. It, it's not... Uh, well, the background of it is political. It's, it's basically a love story. An American woman expatriate painter living in Paris, teaching at the Beaux-Arts, uh, who meets a, an anarchist banker. And uh, it happens during the French Student Revolution in 68. What's the title the of it? The title is Love in the Days of Rage, which comes from uh, Les Enragés, the, the, the uh, French students that started the revolution at Nanterre were, were really a groupuscule uh, that were generally anarchists. That was uh, the beginning. Yeah. And so it comes from Les Enragés was in the original French Revolution. <laughs> not a poetry reading at all. It's really a retrospective of my painting. And all around you, you'll see pictures at an exhibition of my reality. And I'll be your tour guide to the strange, exciting scenes so just pretend it's paint, 
not words. And you will no doubt see what paint and what perspective I have stolen from Goya and Picasso and Motherwell and Klein and de Kooning and all the other seeing eyes of my generation in Plato's cave. So open up your third eyes and see my long landscape laid out before you as I have seen it shimmering in the shaken light of the late, late, late 20th century. Laurel is really impressed by your paintings here in your seaport studio. Makes me ask you, put you the question, what's the real urge to make paintings? And how does it compare to the art of writing poetry? Well, it's all poetry. I happen to be writing with a paintbrush. Uh, different medium, just like shifting from oil to acrylic. Or I'm shifting from words from a pencil to a paintbrush. It's all poetry. To people who are looking at it, does the same thing happen to them when you, they hear you read a poem or when they look at a painting? Well, my poetry is very visual, for one thing. It's a, a visual excitement, which I really don't find in much modern poetry. Uh, it's as if uh, a visitor from another planet were suddenly set down here and is visually excited by everything he sees, uh, constantly astounded. <laughs> I feel I get try and impart that in, in poems and in paintings. I mean, I'm constantly astounded by what I see on the or, or hear on the face of the earth. It usually starts with a visual turn-on in case of my poems, and obviously with a painting it's the same thing. It begins with a visual turn-on. The title sometimes is crucial. For instance, I have one called uh, Atomic Umbrella. It was that big one with the umbrella and the atomic rain is coming through on the pregnant woman. So it, it helps to the reader, uh, the viewer can see a specific interpretation of that painting. It's, an, uh, it's a political uh, statement. Yeah, right. Or a, yeah. But generally, uh, I think uh, you have to avoid these specific, because that becomes too much of a cartoon rather than a painting. I used to be a non-objective painter because I'm really of the generation of uh, Franz Klein and, and de Kooning and Motherwell and the New York School. Then I came to sort of a dead end and didn't paint for about 15 years. And when I went back to painting, I've been painting figurative ever since. So that bridges the gap. Look, something new is happening over there. I know. What else is new? It's nice. It's like the old uh, ammonites, the uh, hmm. it's prehistoric stones. And the sign coming out, a sign of life. Yeah. Ah, Bay Area, shoreline. Holy Mountain. It's a constant a battle with the image. The image, from the non-objective, the objective image tries to take over. You know, see here, you could say this is a lake shore here mm -hmm. with trees. Suddenly, the, it's as if the order of the universe, or the chaos of the universe, is trying to make order of itself. Yeah? 
It's very mysterious what's <laughs> happening. Go. I mean, <laughs> two old salts. <laughs> Come on, say something intelligent. I have nothing intelligent to say. The wind tells a story, and, and the wind and the sail and the seagulls coming by. Yeah. Oh, right. No, but the sheer beauty of it. How to share ecstasy. How right. to how to bring joy from one person to another. So many people who really don't know about this thing, and uh, they don't have the money, and they don't have the occasion, and no education. How to to bring that over? <laughs>